Thanks, Ian. Merci, thanks, Ian, to uh, organizing this very important session. Okay, at our table, basically, we, uh, we have very, very interesting conversations, very good uh, discussions, so uh, I'm just here to report what was said, basically. We have identified five themes that we think really emerged from uh, this morning uh, presentations. First, we, uh, we hear digitization quite a lot, la numérisation, donc c'est au cœur uh, des présentations de ce matin. Et uh, en particulier, toute la question... It was at the heart of what I said this morning, especially uh, document management and record management. Uh, this, uh, this is a challenge as far as digitization is concerned, the preservation of, uh, of those types of uh, records to create a uh, digital culture. So it's more than working with digital formats and just changing the format of a document. We, we think we need a very strong and robust leadership to change that, to change the culture. The importance of partnership and collaborations. Uh, we have to make sure that uh, we have a collaborative approach to address emerging challenges and collaborations and partnership, not just uh, within a very small circle, but much more broadly with museums, community, with, with uh, universities, uh, with uh, private sector companies, so uh, we have to have a very broad, develop very broad partnerships. Also very important to, to uh, promote uh, archivists and the works that uh, we do in archives. Well, we're preaching to the converted here, but uh, it is important to remind uh, you of it. Uh, and uh, it's important to be more proactive, not to be afraid of uh, taking, of uh, occupying our space and demonstrating the added value that uh, we, we're giving. For example, uh, in the area of education, in uh, the business area, civil society, and also the role of uh, archives uh, in uh, uh, to ensure democracy in our societies. And uh, also the importance uh, to, adapt, to adopt a, a client and a user perspective. So not only having programs from our point of view, but also understanding the reality of users and clients. And uh, there is a need uh, to have a sustained and integrated investment strategy. The one challenge that we think was not uh, addressed this morning or not really uh, discussed was the need for a national and collaborative acquisition strategy. We felt that too often uh, we compete each other for acquisitions, and there's probably a need to have more collaborations and, and more uh, integrated strategy at that level. Uh, for the next question, we think that uh, very clearly at our table, at least, there was a very strong commitment uh, to work together. There was a commitment also to uh, try to make sure that we better communicate, and that, uh, that I think was quite important. Things that we think are quite important, if we don't do it, that will not work. First, we should not underestimate the significance of the digital shift. C'est très important. Et puis la deuxième chose qui est important. And the second thing that is important is not to try to apply a digital thought or, uh, or uh, an analog uh, thought or reflection in a digital world. And uh, for the next steps, we think it's important to analyze properly the discussions that uh, we've had this afternoon and develop an, ag an agenda for the next steps. Uh, we were trying to see who could do that. Uh, we started talking about that. Uh, of course, uh, we're uh, at uh, Library and Ar Archives Canada. We're interested in participating uh, in that and perhaps even taking leadership uh, as a first step if that's what people want. I uh, think that reflects our discussions, but I'll give the opportunity to our colleagues uh, to add something. Merci. Merci. Um, good points. Another table, another volunteer over there, Laura. So, oh, did they just confirm everything you wanted? No, they didn't. <laughs> Which means that I am just the messenger. 
Uh, <laughs> but that's okay. You've got my words written down. Uh, it was a lively and fascinating discussion. Uh, I think we started by saying in very Canadian way, there is no one blueprint, there are many blueprints. There are many ways through the woods. Uh, we talked about shared values and, and communities and the idea that we were addressing issues, challenges and opportunities. And so what we did is said, what are those issues, challenges or opportunities that need to be addressed in these many blueprints? I've, we've come up with eight by my count. These are not in order of priority. They're in order of Laura madly taking notes, giving them numbers to link them back and not daring to change the numbers because she would lose her thread. So we talked about the digital, the urgency of managing the digital, the division in care between analog and digital and how they were going to need different strategies uh, for perhaps the same end. We talked about awareness raising as an issue, about archival literacy, uh, but also about self-promotion and outreach for the archival community. So there was a balance there between awareness raising about records and archives and about the profession and the institutions. We talked about acquisition, appraisal, and archival holdings, and as with our um, previous speakers here, acquisition strategies came up I said, despite my hair color, I'm old enough to remember that it didn't work necessarily the last few times we tried it, but that doesn't mean we might not try it again. Um, we talked about access to archives, reference and use, and uh, the difference perhaps between Archives Canada as an access tool, reference tool, and Google, and recognizing that we have to come to terms with the Google world and but what is the role of the tools we've already created and do we reinvent a wheel that we feel already works. We talked within that about virtual access versus physical access and an excellent point was made about the joy of physical discovery in the archives, uh, the sensory experience of using the archives. We talked a lot about user needs and uh, the phrase I wrote down is what's the point Whose interest are we serving? Uh, we did, just at the end of our conversation, in light of that, talk about records serve clientels, records bring users to archives. So I think a critical question is, why are we keeping this? What are we doing with it? And who or what are we serving? Uh, seventh point was archives as a public good, or are archives a public good? Uh, why are archives important? Can companies be trusted to keep their archives? Which was a discussion around bringing them into custody versus leaving them in situ with the creating agency. And so what are the legal obligations around preserving a public good, if in fact it is defined as such? And finally, we talked about professional practice issues for archivists. Uh, the idea of the need to continue with development of descriptive standards, to continue, finish the process of developing arrangement standards, to rejuvenate RAD, to involve users in that process so that those standards are suitable for this clientele, uh, which then became a question of is it the record or the user? And if Barbara Craig were here, she would say, read my article. We didn't get to how to make it happen, but it was a lively discussion. Did I leave anything out, group three? No? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Laura. And um, yes. Hi, so I'm uh, speaking for Table 4 here. Um, we talked about a lot of the same things that, that Table 3 just presented. Um, questions around uh, digital versus physical access, the pros and cons, uh, around whether or not it was time to change the way we prioritize uh, collecting born digital materials versus uh, physical or uh, digitizing physical. Um, the nature of archives in relation to the government, what's the role in promoting accountability and things like that. Um, a lot of that stuff is, was just now well covered, so I 
we'll kind of let that stand. But I think there were two themes that that we sort of pulled out and, and played with a lot in our conversation. And the first was this idea of collaboration, which we heard again and again and again this morning. And we need to collaborate. And, and OK, we just have to figure out how, right? So the, the idea that was proposed is that, that there are collaborations that are easy and there are collaborations that are hard. And the easy stuff is by and large stuff that we're kind of already doing, like uh, sharing our knowledge, coming together in rooms like this to talk and share experiences sharing expertise, and in some cases, even sharing some basic kind of technical infrastructure that we can easily do if we're part of institutions that have kind of a gentlemanly agreement and things like that. But there's, there's another deeper level of kind of harder collaboration, and that's around uh, sharing resources. And the, the point was made that that is perhaps unlikely to happen in a Canadian context right now because there are so many institutions out there that have so little in the way of resources already that they perhaps can't, don't feel as though they can share what they have. They're just barely kind of keeping their heads above water. So from that, the, the conversation kind of morphed into this idea of, okay, well, how then can we, uh, you know, either revitalize those institutions somewhat or give them some avenue to start uh, pulling resources or things in so that they can start to give back to the communities, which kind of helps create positive feedback loop there, and start feeding into you know this core of this larger archival community, and uh, so you know we naturally started talking about how you know small community archives, which we're just here, you know doom and gloom about, can start engaging users. And the idea was was pitched out that rather than just relying on this uh, model where we invite people in to come and discover material in the archives that we sort of put ourselves out there as purveyors of expertise and knowledge and in some cases services around preservation and curation of a body of documents. And um, you know this idea that we can tie the mission of the archives to everyday activities that people already engage in like curating a playlist of songs online or you know dealing with their online presence. Um, that we have some level of expertise that we can help them uh, understand that process a little better. And, and also that we can help them deal with a glut of digital documents that they have. You know, it's, it's not an entirely straightforward process for an individual uh, to curate their collection of digital photographs that they've had for probably close to 10 years now. Um, it's something that we're pretty familiar with, um, those of us who deal with electronic materials, but uh, you know, you're, my parents are not very good at it. So I, I think archives have, in that way, kind of a service that can be put back out to the community to say, you know, come in, we deal with this stuff all the time, you know, we can help you deal with it, and in essence, kind of help you become an archivist, or did you know that you're kind of already an archivist, because you have this body of documents, too, that you're kind of collecting and preserving. and. Not only in that way do they do they get out into the community and build some goodwill, but it also potentially becomes a way uh, uh, to to get collections from out in the world, right? So if people are coming in and and the idea was mentioned earlier in the day, this kind of antiques roadshow model of of digitization, where people come in and you know you've got your Super 8 home videos, we'll digitize it for you, give you the video back, give you a DVD. If you want, you can leave a copy of it with the archives. Maybe it becomes part of the record of this town. And then you know that allows those archives to kind of create more localized, even if they're small scale, uh, displays or collections that help engage individuals in the history of that town or that community. Um, you know, and, and potentially in turn helps them build a positive association with the archives in their community. And that, you know, Building that engagement was key to doing any sort of awareness building or telling a story or trying to get people to rally behind the flag of archives. You know, we, we have to actually make them like us first, not just like us in an idea. Uh, did I miss anything? It was... Thanks. Well, to like us, they only have to get to know us. And I, years ago at a heritage conference, I tried to start a campaign, take an archivist to lunch, um, but haven't had many offers. Um, anyway, other tables down here, Ken, you want to?
My apologies, I'm not an archivist, I'm a librarian, so, uh, but, uh, and my notes are from uh, Julie, who is, yeah, thank you, welcome, who is uh, from the Association for Canadian Studies. She took the notes for our table, but had to leave. Um, we actually spent a fair amount of time talking about the fact that I think we felt the real divide was not necessarily between digital and analog, it was between uh, the same document as a record and the same document as an archive, that that was part of where the divide actually occurred. Um, we talked about the fact that we needed to sort of join the two professions that are dealing with records management and archival uh, processes. And in fact, uh, Carell talked about the fact that in, in Quebec there is much more of an attempt and, and quite successful attempt to join those two professions where you are looking at the document from the very front end of the document and beginning to think about its archival process right from the very beginning. And then because we had our guest American at the table, we also talked about the fact that that is not necessarily the case in much of the United States where the, the process of records management and, and archival management are in fact uh, viewed as being quite different professions in, 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 in their entirety. We talked about the fact that the new blueprint had to include a wider number of partners, including uh, such people as the IT people, that as you're beginning to uh, combine that process of records management and archival processes, then that management process had to involve the digital record at the very beginning, which does mean uh, bringing in a wider variety of not just the creator of the document, but the, those who are responsible for it in a technical environment. We talked about better defined uh, positions and tasks for our, our archivists and the fact that we needed many more partnerships. And as I mentioned, we kept coming back to the issue of the, 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 the divide is the record as uh, current information and as archival information. We did then talk quite a bit about some of the smaller archives because we were taken, I think, with the slide that was presented that showed that 64% of the uh, archivals uh, actually had less than $10,000 budgets. And we did talk about, though, the fact that some of the grants tended to create insular collections instead of uh, creating collections that could be combined, shared, and brought up uh, almost into that cloud and that what sometimes may be needed from small of the libraries is the is the combined expertise from some of the larger organizations in that cloud management process where you can put your records and you can be uh, sharing them and people can find them. I love the fact that because public awareness keeps coming up and one comment that was made and I think Jordan made it when he did it is he says you know that there's almost within the profession of a pejorative sense that if you're using terms like business plans or marketing that you shouldn't be doing that, that it's not part of our particular profession. And, and what uh, the real feeling was that is that part of that uh, public awareness does come from combining records, sharing them, putting them into a cloud environment, making sure that uh, people can go to one place to search for uh, documents on a wide variety of records, creating that mass or public mass where people want to look for the records and will find you when they're actually there. Um, we talked about the fact that we can't base our plan, whatever that plan looks like, the new plan, on what government should do. Uh, that, in fact, the comment was made that what we should do is build a plan that is so enth enthusing that they want to participate and then pretend that it's their idea if they possibly can. Uh, there was a great deal of complimentary language actually about the CCA and in fact the comment that Carol made was uh, CCA 2.0 is what we really need when we're beginning to look into the future. Um, and then we started talking about what does the non-custodial archival practice look like into the future and that that maybe is one of those sort of combined activities for the entire profession that can get such enthusiasm that people would get behind it. I know I've um, had to be clear to the people I've worked with over at uh, OpenText when they talk about working in the cloud. I learned in Newfoundland that when you're working in the cloud, the technical term is fog. <laughs> I believe that's what you're working in. Um, the back tables, yes, over there, yes. Hello, hello. I'm from illustrious table number five in the back. I apologize, I do have a cold. Um, won't let, won't uh, harm my ability to talk, I'm pretty sure. 
So we jumped around on our uh, list of questions here. We actually started with question number two, which was what, haven't, what hasn't been identified this morning? And um, one of the things, what we thought that came up was um, a question of how we are to engage government. And that uh, if we can't seem to engage government from the top, perhaps what we should do is um, uh, try uh, a bottom, bottom up approach. So those 900 points of light that were brought out in Lois York's paper, um, maybe it's the community archives, the small archives that are gonna push the momentum from the bottom up. We also talked about the media and how um, they are actually interested, as we can see from our NADP campaign, um, we got quite a bit of press coverage, um, and most recently with the closing of the recent federal libraries, um, they're interested in what's going on. So we need to continue to raise our profile in the media, make sure we advocate to them. We talked about how uh, the money that's given uh, from the federal government for commemoration events like 2017 um, are around events and archives are immovable, immutable objects. We are not events in and of themselves, of ourselves. Um, and yet, all of those events are ultimately going to turn to archives for resources. So how can we leverage that? Um, many of these events are going to be physical but also virtual and they're go those virtual events are going to need content and to get that content they're going to go to the archives. How can we, instead of being at the back end, get around to the front? Then we turn to, let's see, we jumped down to uh, and we combined what do we think will work with what do we think will not work. There was questions about how all those 900 points of light, all those small, ar small archives are gonna survive in a large catalog like Archives Canada. Will they get lost in the big picture? An emphasis on all those small, ar small archives doing good work. They're all doing good work, but are they all being equally recognized as a partners? <clears throat> Um, and we kept, came back a few times to the CCA, to the Canadian Council of Archives vision of the Canadian archival community as a network of networks. Um, and that perhaps that is the blueprint going forward, is reinvigorating CCA 2.0, um, that network of networks. So that there would be the traditional archival communities as nodes on the network, the CCA, uh, LAC, the Territorial Provincial Councils, the Council of Provincial and Ter Territorial Archivists, the ACA, but also maybe some non-traditional partners, non-traditional nodes in the network um, with our museum pals and our librarian pals, with the historical societies, the genealogical societies, other users, maybe corporations, maybe business. None of these nodes on the network would take on leader, all of these nodes on the network would be leaders in different situations and on different projects and in different initiatives. So equal partners taking on leadership roles as their expertise comes available. And we also talked about perhaps we have blinders when it comes to business and enterprise and private enterprise helping to fund public archives. Um, and that, in fact, private money can add value, can fund value-added services like digitization, uh, indexing, transcribing. And then we jumped right down to what are the next steps. Um, and so we, we came back again to our uh, nodes on the network, to the CCA's network of networks, um, uh, with an emphasis on continued partnerships and continued and inventive and different collaboration. Engaging the public through every media um, outlet uh, available, traditional and non-traditional. Increasing the noise is what we were talking about. Increasing the noise through crowdsourcing. Increasing the noise through non-traditional finding aids. <clears throat> And finally, we ended off with um, a comment that money needs to be set aside in every archives, big or small, um, for public uh, outreach and public relations, that it is not an off the side of the desk 
uh, task in the archival world, it is actually a core function, and we should be um, assigning money to it accordingly. And that's what we talked about at table number five. And Good afternoon, I'm Dominique Marshall from the Canadian Historical Association. So here's what table six uh, did. We did our own questions. Um, so we discussed cooperation between museum archives, libraries and education institutions. And we talked about the hopes and the limits of these collaborations. Um, at worst, uh, museums are favored because they tell one story and archives are a place of independent inquiry and that's a danger that's been mentioned in some of the papers and at our table. At best, if it's done uh, with mutual respect uh, for the values and the roles of each profession and each institution, it can um, create some synergy and also eventually lead to a much better engagement with the public, but it's got to be done right. So it's not a, a panacea uh, and it's got to be done carefully. And there's a need in that case, as in many other things we've been talking about, for a constant exchange of best practices. And in order to do that, when the networks to exchange, like the CCA, have less resources, it's harder, but best practices can help avoid the failures of the past. Like we still think at that table that creating common digital repositories for smaller archives is a good idea, but there's been many catastrophes, very costly catastrophes, and if we were able to exchange on the reasons for the successes and the failures, it would be good. We thought also that um, um, it's important, many people have said that, to continue to be uh, present in the public as advocates and that it should be more, even more than now when there is a scandal in Canada of accountability uh, with documents, like the recent one with the PMO uh, emails, uh, that we show up even more than we do now. We do uh, at the CHA and the Association of Archivists and the librarians are better at it, but it's still not enough. And we discuss how the National Coalition for History, which is a different beast in the States, which was very efficient, does that better. Um, we spoke about, uh, finally, uh, uh, maybe, I mean, all sorts of other things have been mentioned, but. The, the danger of assuming, because of budgetary difficulties, that private is better, and to too readily adopt the language of clients and business when there is a long tradition of citizenship and public life, which should always be uh, a priority. Thank you. 